Welcome to an example of free damped vibration. A mass weighing eight pounds stretches a spring six inches. The mass is in a medium that exerts a viscous resistance of 12 pounds when the mass has a velocity of four feet per second. Suppose the object is displaced an additional six inches and released. We want to find an equation for the object's displacement u of t in feet after t seconds. So to model the situation using the homogeneous second order differential equation given here, where u of t is a displacement function, m is the mass, gamma is the dampening coefficient, and k is the spring constant. Now if you did watch the videos on free undamped vibration, in those videos we use the function x of t for the displacement function, and for this example we're using u of t. Other than that, the only difference between undamped vibration and damped vibration is that for damped vibration we have this extra term, gamma times u prime of t, again because we have damped vibration. This term does not appear in undamped vibration, notice how we don't have an x prime of t term. So going back to our example, let's first list all the given information, then we'll work on determining the mass, dampening coefficient, and the spring constant. So we're given the mass weighs eight pounds, so W equals eight pounds. And the spring is stretched six inches, so L is six inches. But because we're going to be using feet, let's convert six inches to feet, so this is equal to half a foot. Next is a viscous resistance of 12 pounds when the mass has a velocity of four feet per second, which means a dampening force F sub D is equal to 12 pounds when the velocity is four feet per second, meaning U prime of T equals four feet per second. The object is displaced an additional six inches, which means U of zero equals six inches or half a foot. And then the object is released, so there's no initial velocity, so this also tells us that u prime of zero equals zero. Now let's find the mass. The mass is equal to the weight divided by the acceleration due to gravity. So that would be eight pounds divided by, because we're dealing with feet and seconds, the acceleration due to gravity would be 32 feet per second squared, which gives us one-fourth, and the units would be slugs, so we have one-fourth of a slug. Next we'll find the dampening coefficient using this formula here. The dampening force is equal to the opposite of gamma, the dampening coefficient, times the velocity given by u prime of t. And because the dampening force is always in the opposite direction of the velocity, we can actually ignore this negative sign and say that gamma is equal to the displacement force divided by the velocity. So in this case, we'd have 12 pounds divided by four feet per second, which would give us three pound seconds per foot. And then finally, we need to find the spring constant K, where the spring constant K is equal to W divided by L, which would be eight pounds divided by half a foot, so the spring constant K is equal to 16 pounds per foot. And now we have all the information we need in order to set up the second order differential equation. The situation is modeled by the differential equation given by the mass, which is one-fourth, times U double prime of T, plus the dampening coefficient, which is three, times u prime of t plus the spring constant k, which is 16, times u of t equals zero. And now we'll find the general solution to this differential equation using a characteristic equation, and then we'll find the particular solution using the initial conditions. So going to the next slide, let's go ahead and multiply both sides of the equation by four so that we have u double prime of t plus 12 times u prime of t plus 64 times u of t equals zero. 
So the corresponding characteristic equation would be one r squared or r squared plus 12r plus 64 equals zero. Now this is not factorable. It requires the quadratic formula, but I won't show the work here to save some time. This comes out to r equals negative six plus or minus two square root seven i. So because we have two complex solutions or two complex roots, remember the general solution will be in this form here where the roots are in the form of alpha plus or minus beta i. So notice here, alpha is equal to negative six and beta equals two square root seven, which means the general solution is u of t equals c sub one e to the negative six t times cosine of two square root seven t plus c sub two e to the negative six t times sine of two square root seven t. Now looking at the initial conditions, notice how we have u prime of zero equals zero, so we'll have to find u prime of t. Let's go ahead and do that now. This is gonna take quite a bit of work though because we have to apply the product rule here as well as here. So we'll have u prime of t equals, let's let c sub one e to the negative six t be the first function and the cosine function be the second function. So we'd have c sub one e to the negative six t times the derivative of cosine two square root seven t so we'd have negative two square root seven c sub one e to the negative six t times the sine of two square root seven t and then plus the cosine function times the derivative of c sub one e to the negative six t. It's actually gonna be minus six c sub one e to the negative six t times cosine of two square root seven t. So this difference is the derivative of this first term, and now we need to apply that product rule again to find the derivative of the second term. So we'd have plus c sub two e to the negative six t times the derivative of sine two square root seven t. So we'd have plus two square root seven c sub two e to the negative six t times cosine of two square root seven t. And then plus the sine function times the derivative of c sub two e to the negative six t, so we'd have minus six c sub two e to the negative six t times the sine of two square root seven t. Now let's use the initial condition u of zero equals one half in our function u of t. So we'll substitute zero for t and one half for u of t. So we'd have the equation one half equals Again, we substitute zero for t, so we'd have c sub one e to the zero cosine zero plus c sub two e to the zero sine zero. Well, sine zero is equal to zero, so this term simplifies out. e to the zero is one, cosine zero is one. So this equation tells us that c sub one must equal one half. And now we'll use the second initial condition in u prime of t. Let's do this on the next slide. So because we know u prime of zero equals zero, we'll substitute zero for u prime of t and zero for t. So here we'd have negative two square root seven c sub one e to the zero sine zero minus six c sub one e to the zero cosine zero and then plus two square root seven c sub two e to the zero cosine zero minus six c sub two e to the zero sine zero. Well again, we know that sine zero equals zero, so this term simplifies out and so does this term. We know e to the zero is one as so is cosine zero. So we get zero equals, here we're going to have negative six c sub one and then plus two square root seven c sub two. Remember c sub one is equal to one half. Negative six times one half is negative three, so we have zero equals negative three plus two square root seven c sub two. So adding three to both sides and then dividing by two square root seven, we'd have c sub two equals three divided by two square root seven. So now we know c sub one equals one half, and we know c sub two equals three divided by two square root seven, and remember the general solution was in this form here. 
which means the particular solution u of t is equal to c sub one is one half times e to the negative six t times cosine of two square root seven t. And then c sub two is this fraction here. So we have plus three divided by two square root seven e to the negative six t times the sine of two square root seven t. So this function u of t is our displacement function this question is asking for. I hope you found this helpful.